So he moved to CERN in 2012 as a senior research fellow or 2013 actually. And uh, since then uh, he has been heavily involved with the uh, Higgs physics. Uh, he was um, the subgroup convener for Higgs to tau group and also this what we call the tau physics object group. So real and expert in the tau uh, physics object. Um, and uh, he has also the convener of the LSC Higgs group working group. And recently, um, I think since last year, he has been one of the two co-convener of Higgs physics uh, analysis group within CMS. So he's a real expert uh, of the field and we're really pleased to have him with us. Uh, and he will talk uh, to us about Higgs decay to left turn. So Jan, the floor is open to you, please. Okay, thanks a lot for the nice introduction and uh, to the invitation for this very interesting meeting where we indeed celebrate a decade of the Higgs. And as you just said, um, I actually joined Higgs physics just after um, the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2013. But I think the, what we did in these last time, nine years is probably at least as amazing as uh, the discovery itself. So I think we're not only celebrating um, the, the anniversary, be it, but everything we learned in the last 10 years. And indeed, I will be talking about Higgs decays to leptons. So this is actually, I guess, uh, looking at your agenda, one of the easier topics because there, there are only three leptons. And as you know, the electrons are so light um, that they are very, very difficult to see in, in Higgs boson decays unless uh, they are very non-standard model-like. So we'll mostly be talking about Higgs decays to tau leptons um, and to muons, where Higgs decays to tau leptons are one of our main handles to constrain the Higgs coupling to fermions overall. So you already heard a bit about this earlier today uh, by Lucas for the Higgs decays to quarks and for the Higgs coupling to quarks also in the production. But the tau's are really a key handle to, to also help constrain um, the fermion coupling. And then the muons are our best handle to actually check um, the couplings to the second generation. Um, as you also heard this morning, for C quarks, um, this may be possible at the LHC, but it will still be a while, whereas for muons, um, as you probably know already, but as I um, just go into a bit, bit more detail, uh, we are kind of at the verge of uh, discovery uh, with run three. So let's go into a bit more detail of the decays of the 125GV Higgs bosons to leptons. So um, on the right-hand side, you see all the Higgs boson branching fractions to different particles. In particular, you see uh, the WW and ZZ branching fractions. You won't see the diphoton one because it's uh, too small to be visible here, but these three were the kind of the main um, discovery channels. Then you heard earlier today about the BB bar branching fraction, which is the largest decay branching fraction to fermions with 58%. Um, but then the next, next important one is already the um, Di Tau one with 6.2% branching fraction. So this is actually a, a sizable branching fraction, larger than ZZ um, and Gamma Gamma, but given the backgrounds, it's actually a bit more challenging. And I'll go into some of these challenges on the next slide. Um, then the other leptons are also similar to gamma gamma, uh, not visible on this on this slide. So for muons, um, the branching fraction is given by the branching fraction of the Higgs boson to two tau leptons uh, times the muon mass divided by the tau mass squared. So you can use the, uh, the, the well-known masses and calculate yourself and you'll get to 0.02%. So this is super tiny, 10 times smaller than the Higgs boson to case to two photons. And then yet a lot smaller is the branching fraction to two electrons with five times 10 to the minus nine. So this, this will be really, at, at, at any given collider, this will be super difficult um, um, to measure. So, um, and then I want to briefly look back to the discovery itself and which uh, role tau leptons played. So here on the left-hand side, you see the CMS results um, for all the channels that were probed at the time. On the right-hand side, the Atlas results. And you see um, kind of the nice constraints on the best fit um, cross-section divided by the Stenmol cross-section, so the um, signal strength value for gamma, gamma, Z, Z, and WW. And you also see that big to tau tau we had a sensitivity of um, roughly one times um, <coughs> the standard model. So with like um, <clears throat> the 10 inverse time to bounce we had, we were not able to say anything yet about the direct decay of the Higgs boson to fermions. And the same was also true for um, BB bar. And similarly for Atlas, it looked even worse because they had only analyzed 7 TV data for their BB bar and uh, tau tau results. Uh, so I had a much, much larger error bar. Um, 
Let's do want to stay for one slide with this discovery uh, time. Um, again, Hexa Tau Tau. So on the left hand side, you see the reconstructed Dai Tau mass distribution um, from this discovery data set, where you see um, the main backgrounds. So the pink one is QCD, uh, the red one is electro weak background, um, for example, W plus stress production, and the yellow one is set to Tau Tau. And then you see the prediction for a 125 GV Higgs boson as the red line. And you see, if you compare it with the data error bars, that this was indeed um, um, still um, too little data to have any sensitivity. Then you see similarly, Atlas has a very similar distribution here on the right hand side, just with seven TV data, so even larger error bars compared uh, to the standard model Higgs and top prediction, which is here scaled by a factor of five. So, um, with that in mind, and given that we celebrate um, this decade, the first topic that I will be talking about will be um, about the Higgs boson decay to fermions, um, and in particular about the race towards the first evidence uh, for the Dukawa interaction that followed in the years after uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson. And then later on, I'll be talking about um, the very latest results on Higgs Tau Tau, how we pin down the fermion coupling, which is uh, very important to be sensitive to beyond the standard model effects and about the Higgs decay to two muons. But now let's um, go back a bit in time um, to celebrate this, this decade of Higgs and, and uh, look at this race towards the first evidence for um, the carbon interaction. So if we look at the Higgs to Tau Tau decays, um, clearly uh, the Tau lepton is a is, is, is unique in the sense um, that it decays um, further within our detector volume. So it's uh, much harder to detect um, compared to muons and electrons. So each tau decays uh, the 65% chance to hadrons plus one neutrino. Um, and then with the um, 18 and 70% to a muon plus two neutrinos on electron plus two neutrinos. Um, and then if you look at at the resulting di tau final states, where I mark a, a hadronic tau decay as a tau H, you see that we have 42% decays to two hadronic taus, 23% uh, um, each to either muon and electron plus hadronic taus, and only a combined 12% in, in fully leptonic decay. So, what you already see from this is that it's extremely important that we reconstruct um, these hadronic tau decays. And one other thing to keep in mind is that the hadronic tau decays. Um, only come with, with one neutrino, whereas the leptonic ones come with two neutrinos, uh, which makes which kind of makes the um, lepton PT spectrum a lot softer, so much more difficult um, to, to trigger on and also to, um, to reject the backgrounds. Um, a bit more on this on this slide. So um, this is what I mentioned. So we have various final states, so it makes this uh, these overall hexatotonal is quite um, quite interesting because it requires different selections for the final states, very different experimental techniques. Uh, which is different compared to, for example, Higgs to photons, where you kind of just have to um, reconstruct the photons and, and tag the production. And then the neutrinos are very important because they carry away the momentum. Uh, this leads to low PT leptons. The, the average visible PT fraction for leptonic decays is just one third. So this is very difficult to trigger and gives you more uh, experimental background. And then also one other very important thing for the Higgs, because the Higgs is a resonance, very narrow resonance at 125 um, GV, as we know. Um, so it's so the reconstructed mass distribution is very important, um, but MTOT actually has kind of mediocre resolution because of the neutrinos um, in the decay. And then, as I already mentioned, we need to reconstruct, identify, and trigger hadronic tau decays to really get the most uh, sensitivity to hit the tau tau decays. So this is why I want to um, spend one slide on hadronic tau reconstruction and identification um, in CMS. So um, here on the left-hand side, you see the reconstruction algorithms depicted. So we have the one-prong hadronic tau decays. Um, then we have hadronic tau decays uh, to a um, charged hadron and one and two pi zeros. And then we have this, these uh, typical three-prong um, decays. So the uh, one-prong plus pi zero decays typically go via a row resonance and the one to three hadrons via an A1 resonance. So one um, way to visualize this reconstruction is to look at the reconstructed uh, visible hadronic tau mass distribution, which is shown here in the plot on the left hand side, where you see at uh, the charged um, pion mass, you see um, 
um, a peak, this orange peak. So this corresponds to the tau decay that we constructed in this one prong mode. And you see this yellow, very broad peak around the row mass, uh, which corresponds to a hadrons plus strips reconstruction. So a one prong plus by zero tau decays. And then you see the three prong tau decays as this uh, gray distribution. So we, you clearly see here that uh, data and simulation agree, agree very well, and that this uh, tau reconstruction and also the prong momentum reconstruction uh, works very well. So uh, with that, um, with that done, we also need to identify taus, and um, this is very important because there is really absolutely overwhelming background uh, from jets at the LHC. So what we did in run one is that we um, used a cut-based isolation where we um, look at the sum of the PT, for example, of the charged particles in a cone around the hadronic tau axis. Um, that are coming from the primary interaction vertex. And then you can look, you can look at that distribution for hadronic taus in blue and for jets in red. And you see clearly that um, the taus are isolated. So I have very few uh, additional stuff uh, going on. Um, whereas for jets, clearly they, um, they, 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 they fragment and have a nice um, um, and, and parton shower. So there's a lot of lots of activity and uh, there's a lot more energy. So this, this was the main um, identification criterion for the uh, run one analysis. And the other thing that I already alluded to is reconstructing um, the invariant mass distribution, which is the main handle to discriminate against the, the otherwise irreducible um, Z to tau tau background. Um, and clearly, as mentioned already, the challenge here are clearly the neutrinos, uh, particularly at the leptonic decays, you have uh, two the tau decay and one for the hydronic decays. So the plots here are always for the mixed decay, so for the muon plus hydronic tau channel in the CMS case, and for the combined uh, lepton plus hydronic tau case uh, for this atlas plot. So on the left-hand side, you see the resolution that you get if you just look at the visible mass. So just ignore the neutrinos, look at the combined mass of the hydronic uh, tau four vector and the muon. And then you see that there's actually a super big overlap between, <coughs> sorry, um, the Higgs tau tau distribution <clears throat> and the Z to tau, tau background. Um, then what we do to improve the resolution is that we use a matrix element technique because we know in theory everything about the tau decay. So we can implement that and use a matrix element technique to estimate um, the mass that will then um, also take into account the missing, reconstructed missing transverse momentum vector. And we'll kind of divide this missing momentum uh, within resolution amongst the different uh, taus to obtain an improved res uh, estimate for the mass. And you see that this works quite well because there's actually much better separation between Z to tau tau and Higgs to tau tau background here, though there is clearly also still overlap. So Z to tau tau will remain one important background. So this here is for inclusive tau decays. Now, um, one, as, as I show in the next slide, one very important um, category to uh, reject background is actually to be looking at um, Higgs bosons with high PT. I have this momentum, um, so boosted Higgs bosons. And for boosted Higgs bosons, it's actually a bit easier to divide the missing transverse momentum amongst the taus, and then you get even better uh, mass resolution and better separation, as you can see here in the plot uh, from Atlas run one, uh, which used a very similar technique uh, with the Z to tau tau as shown as the black line and the Higgs to tau tau signal as this uh, red dotted line. But still, the Overall um, resolution is only of the order of something like 30%. So this is clearly much, much worse compared to what we could achieve with the high resolution um, channels. Now let's look at the production side for X to tau tau. Um, so I will be focusing on the two most frequent and most sensitive production modes, even though we sometimes also analyze um, the other production modes. But these two most frequent ones are also the most important um, for identifying Higgs to tau tau decays and measuring the Higgs coupling deferments. So the first one is uh, gluon fusion. Um, we typically look at two different um, overall categories in Higgs to tau tau analysis. One is uh, gluon fusion with zero jets. This has the largest rate, so this is nice. But on the other hand, it also has very large background. And in particular, the Z to tau tau background um, tends to also come with, uh, with zero jets. So we mainly use the zero jet channel um, to calibrate, for example, a tau reconstruction and, and to use set tau tau as a standard candle, even though at, at, with, with a lot of data, uh, we can also make out a significant um, peak in that channel. Uh, then more importantly, um, this, this boosted category, this is a um, Higgs plus uh, 
a one or multi-jet production, typically plus one jet, where you, you get a Higgs boson with high PT. So um, this will um, reduce the electroweak background um, because this so Higgs bosons are gluon fusion produced. Um, the elect main gradient background is QQ bar initiated, um, so it will be less likely to radiate and also have a less pronounced tail because it's at a lower scale. So this will reduce the electroweak background. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, it will also improve the uh, reconstructed um, tau tau invariant mass resolution. So this category is one of the main drivers of Higgs tau tau um, analyses. And then kind of the, the golden channel for Higgs to tau tau is um, the vector both fusion channel, which has overall clearly lower cross-section as shown here in red, um, but then has the added advantage um, of having this um, these two forward jets. And we tag this by requiring a um, high diet invariant mass and or um, a large pseudo-rapidity separation between these two reconstructed jets here. And this helps us um, reject background. So this is this would then be by far the cleanest channel uh, at the expense of a significantly reduced number of events. And these kind of this boosted category of the vector boson fusion category, um, these together will drive sensitivity of these Higgs to tau tau um, analysis. So now um, on to the analysis strategy for this um, first post Higgs discovery um, Higgs to tau tau search. Um, so what we did there is, um, so to, to extract the signal, um, we kind of make fits to the reconstructed diatom variant mass distribution in multiple event categories. And these uh, multiple event categories were carefully chosen um, to maximize the sensitivity while clearly keeping overall the number of categories manageable and to um, still allow for reliable background estimation. You see the overall <laughs> quite big scheme here on the right hand side. Um, some people um, used to call it a, a Brock scheme because it's very uh, uh, fine grained and detailed. But let me uh, briefly uh, go through this. So as I mentioned, we have these, uh, this zero jet channel, which is mainly there to constrain backgrounds. Then we have this uh, one jet or boosted channel, uh, which we subdivide into a category with low hydronic tau um, PT, high hydronic tau PT, and the one with extra high PT, which is, will be the most signal sensitive. And then we have two, two jet categories targeting vector boson fusion with either loose tags or loose requirements on uh, the diejet invariant mass and the zero rapidity separation and also tighter criteria, including again, um, a requirement on the boost of the Higgs also. And we have these similar um, categories for all the different channels. So muon plus hydronic tau, electron plus hydronic tau, and the electron muon channel for, for run one. Uh, we actually still also analyze the dielectron and dimuon channels, uh, which improve the sensitivity a bit. Um, but then finally, um, the big addition for us for the ATV data was the fully hydronic tau channel because uh, we needed the triggers for this. And there, given the uh, low overall event numbers, um, we only have three uh, or had three categories at that time. And you see here, here on the left hand side, a reconstructed diatom variant mass distribution in the BBF tag category of this fully hydronic tau decay channel, um, where you see that in this channel alone, um, we kind of have a bit of sensitivity that's that's visible maybe to the um, uh, 125 GB Higgs signal shown as the blue dashed line. Then combining all these event categories, uh, we can make summary plots of all of those. So on the left hand side, this is the um, signal of a signal plus background weighted invariant uh, diatom mass distribution, um, where you see where it's very hard to see it from this from this main plot. Where we are still dominated by the um, Z to tau, tau background in particular, but also the electro weak background more towards 125 GB. But then, if we make the background subtract plot, um, we see kind of a, a, a nice visible Higgs to tau, tau signal shown here as this uh, red filled area, and then you also see the background uncertainty. Uh, we can also make a different plot where we, instead of showing the reconstructed diatom variant mass, we look at the log of um, the S over S plus B in all the bins in these diatom invariant mass distributions. Um, this will then also include, so, so one thing I didn't mention is that in addition to BBF and gluon fusion, we also include W and Z boson associated production in this analysis. And um, there you see in the most signal sensitive bins that are dominated by either BBF production in red or by this uh, boost production here in yellow, um, 
that these together also give us some hint um, of a Higgs to tau tau signal. And then indeed, if we look at the um, expected and observed local p value as a function of Higgs boson mass, we see at uh, 125 GeV that we have a 3.7 expected um, signif signal, signal significance with 3.2 observed. Um, so we were able to claim evidence for Higgs to tau tau decays. One interesting thing to note from this plot is that if you look at the overall sensitive expected sensitivity, so this is a simple mass analysis, that actually 125 is kind of the sweet spot um, for Higgs to tau tau sensitivity. So in that sense, uh, from the perspective of measuring the fermion couplings and measuring precisely also the coupling to leptons, um, it's, it's, uh, it happens to be in a super well spot um, the Higgs boson mass, so we are able to, to uh, measure this as precisely as possible. And then one other thing that in particular at that time was still quite important because we had the discovery of the Higgs boson at 125 GeV in these um, high resolution channels plus in Higgs to WW. Um, but since we had no whatsoever evidence of any decays to fermions, it was also very important to confirm that actually the um, mass that we extract, so that where we find the signal is consistent with 125 GV because it could also be conceivable that we have a different state that decays to fermions compared to the ones that decays uh, um, to bosons. And here we clearly see that um, because we're using this data reconstructed in very mass as an observable, uh, we are able to, um, if you look at this observed likelihood scan here in, in uh, black, you see that we, see something that's consistent with uh, 125 GV and we uh, could also make a mass measurement out of this of 122 plus minus 7 GV. So this was consistent with the observed scalar and um, well this is now clearly we take all of this for granted but at the time this uh, was an important byproduct of this analysis. Now I also want to look at the other side of the ring towards Atlas so at the very same time um, um, they also looked for Higgs tau tau, but with a different method. So they uh, did something that's uh, nowadays done more and more often. So they uh, extracted the signal with boosted decision trees in two main categories that are already introduced. So vector boson fusion and, and uh, boosted. And clearly trained a BDT using uh, a plethora of uh, kinematic input variables, including um, the reconstructed uh, dial tau mass. And then you see it here on the left-hand side, the distribution in this uh, VBF category uh, for the lepton plus the bronic tau channels, um, where the zeta tau tau background is shown in blue, so you see that that's uh, the most important background at uh, the highest VDT outputs. And then uh, if you want to see the signal, so this is shown here as this, uh, as this, as this uh, red line. Actually, Atlas, um, as I've shown the next slide, uh, extracted the signal strength of 1.4, so a bit higher um, than the expectation from the standard model and we're able to uh, see a bit more clearly um, the Higgs to tau tau signal. You sort of see it in this, in this ratio plot where the no Higgs boson hypothesis is shown as this uh, black line. So you clearly see that uh, the data more consistent with the Higgs to tau tau hypothesis. And similarly, though uh, less visible for this boosted um, category. So, um, also for Atlas, you can make a plot instead of showing um, just the BT output distributions in all the different categories. Um, you can make a summary plot, uh, in this case of the logarithm to the 10 of um, the signal of a background in each bin of the BDT of all the BDT distributions. And there you can again compare um, the background only hypothesis. Um, so this is this, this um, dashed line with um, signal plus background hypothesis, either at the best fit value, which is dark red, or at the uh, new equals one, which is the light red. And you again see that um, um, there's a quite visible signal here. Um, and so Atlas achieved an expected significance of 3.4 standard deviation, so a bit smaller, but very consistent with the CMS one. Uh, but we're lucky in the sense that I had a bigger observed uh, signal. And you also see that here um, as, this, as this star. One thing to note is that because Atlas used this BDT, it was a, it's, it's a bit um, kind of the, the mass extraction uh, uh, was a bit less clear. So I actually think that it was a very interesting and, and kind of important development that we used these different methods at the time because we used these very independent methods, but we're both able to find evidence uh, for Higgs to tau tau decays. 
Um, so you see here one very nice um, candidate at the highest BDT scores in the vector boson fusion channel that I just observed. So you see these four, which I see as these uh, blue cones. And then a reconstructed muon here, reconstructed in the muon system, and then here a reconstructed um, hadronic tau candidate. And then you also see uh, the uh, um, yes, you have the view. Okay, so um, besides just having evidence, we um, also put constraints on the coupling modifiers to fermions and vector bosons. So at the top right, I just repeat, you heard it a lot this week, so I won't be reading this, but uh, just reference the coupling modifiers either in the production um, or in the, in the decay. And so we can decompose each um, production channel and decay channel into these different couplings and, and then either associate it to a vector boson fusion, um, uh, sorry, to, to the vector boson coupling or the fermion coupling, and then make a plot of the constraint um, on the fermion coupling kappa f and the vector boson coupling kappa v. And then you see that we actually uh, achieve quite nice sensitivity. So this here is from the CMS result on this uh, on this on this kappa f here. It's around 20% uh, in this range. And then uh, um, where we observed because we had a low observed signal strength and the observed value is a bit lower than the standard model prediction. And then I should also mention that um, if you compare it with the right hand plot that Actually, the sensitivity to kappa v in this um, plot is is not so bad because we have added sensitivity from Higgs WW decays in the electron plus muon final state, which also help us um, constrain a bit this uh, this this kappa v. But this doesn't come or it doesn't exclusively come uh, from vector boson fusion produced uh, Higgs tau tau decays. And then on the right hand side, this is just to put this into perspective from the combined Atlas and CMS run one results. You see all the different constraints from different analyses uh, on these uh, kappa F and kappa V coupling modifier values, uh, where you see the Higgs to tau tau expected constraints um, in this purple color. And you clearly see that if you look at this fermion axis alone near um, the standard model expectation, um, that this is the channel that gives the tightest constraints. On, um, on the fermion coupling. So clearly the, the overall combined value is a bit better because there, there are also constraints coming uh, from the other chats. And then actually, so um, still on run one, we combined Atlas and CMS and the overall coupling combination. And in this coupling combination, we actually observed for the, for the first time um, Higgs to tau tau decays. Um, with an expected significance of uh, 5.0 standard deviations and a measured significance of 5.5. So this was a clear um, observation of a fixed tau, tau decay. So you can see also on the right hand side um, how the signal strength values came out in this overall combination um, here for it makes the case to tau leptons. So the CMS line is shown here in red. You see this a bit lower observed signal strength compared to the expectation of one from Atlas. And then the combination. Um, and then finally, still, still in evidence uh, observation mode, jumping to round two, to early round two. Uh, in early round two, we were then finally able to also have single experiment observations of Higgs tau tau decays. Um, here on the left hand uh, side, um, I show the plot for CMS, uh, where we were able to get in the round one and round two combination to 5.9. Um, sigma expected sensitivity um, exactly equal um, to the observed one. So we were able to claim a single experiment observation. And then later on, also Atlas managed to do it with the 2016, so early, uh, early round two data uh, with 5.4 ex uh, sigma expected and 6.4 observed. So this just for completeness. Now, um, now we understand everything about how, how the Higgs tau tau analysis work. And uh, I wanted to recall a bit the first evidences and the um, discovery and kind of the first direct um, observation of Higgs decays um, to leptons and, and thereby also of few couple couplings. So this was uh, very important and I thought it's important to, to, to highlight that again and to use that to introduce Higgs tau tau decays. So nowadays clearly still staying on Higgs tau tau um, as, I, as I explained this is the most sensitive coupling to fermions. So we can look the six to tau tau decays amongst other things to look for deviations of the fermion couplings from the standard model predictions. So now it's all about reaching um, higher precision. 
So now before going to um, the updated Higgs et al. Tau results, um, I wanted to briefly introduce um, Higgs cross sections and then also how we're sensitive to new physics. So you will also, I, I will be a bit brief on that because you will hear about this multiple times, but clearly um, the measurements that I've discussed so far um, are inclusive measurements, also fiducial measurements, um, which are typically done separately for different production and decay modes. And, and these are the ones that will lead to these direct constraints on the uh, coupling modifiers. So this is um, one very important aspect. But then also clearly, um, if you want to maximize BSM sensitivity, you can also have um, BS beyond the standard model physics in the production. And one important scheme um, that we came up with as the LHC Higgs community are these simplified template cross sections, these STXS. Uh, we have different bins, for example, zero jet, one jet, two jet, uh, with the lower high dietary invariant mass and so on, to be as sensitive as possible to BSM while also keeping the um, theoretical uncertainties uh, under control and so on. So this is uh, one of these categorization schemes and by measuring those cross sections and all these bins, um, we will get increased sensitivity to beyond the standard model effects. And then also, because, um, I mean, this is a great scheme, but it's also not perfect. So what uh, one additional thing you can do, or one other thing is to also look at differential uh, distributions where you can also, or will generally apply a fiducial selection also for the MDK um, and then sample can measure the reconstructed, um, or you can measure the PT distribution of, uh, of Higgs bosons. So now connecting that to new physics. So on the left-hand side, again, these coupling modifiers that I already talked about a lot. Um, so these can, for example, be used to um, put constraints on the case to undetected particles. But maybe more importantly, for example, if you have an extended Higgs sector, um, this extended Higgs sector will typically, or, or will basically always mix with the standard model Higgs sector. And um, by this mixing, it will modify the couplings of um, the 125 GB Higgs bosons um, for example, to fermions, but also to uh, different particles depending on, on the models. But typically it will lead to different scaling of the couplings to vector bosons um, and then uh, to, to the different kinds of fermions. So uptype and downtype quarks and leptons. Sometimes they're scaled together, sometimes not um, depending on the model. So this is just to explain that um, measuring these coupling modifiers, it, it's not just, just for fun, but this has kind of a direct and it's not only for confirming um, the standard model and the Yukawa interactions, for example, but this is also something that is expected to be modified by very many uh, beyond the standard model um, theories. So this is very important. On the other hand, clearly, for example, if you use this STXS scheme, you can also go in the direction of effective field theory um, as a parameterization for higher scale new physics. And then you can see here on the right hand side, this is just to show it as an example, I won't go into the details, but then you can put constraints on all of these EFT operators. This is more from the production side and to be sensitive to high scale. So this is just to highlight that both of these are very important. So coupling modifiers are important to look at your physics as is uh, doing EFT and, uh, and, and looking at differential distributions. Um, now, getting back to standard model Higgs tau, tau, now I'll start with the ATLAS results. It's actually very interestingly, so ATLAS in their strategy I mentioned for run one, um, they used boosted decision trees, but now their full run two strategy is more similar to the CMS run one result. So now they fit the reconstructed data on variant mass distribution in multiple event categories, um, but targeting a bit more explicitly these S STXS bins that I introduced on the previous slide. So you can see here uh, the different production mods, TTH, VBF, uh, VH, and Q1 fusion. And you can see here these uh, theoretically motivated STXS bins. And then here on the right hand side, all the different um, event categories. So I won't be going into details, but this is just to, to explain how the analysis is done. Um, now you can do this more inclusively by probing just the um, um, simple production modes. This is shown here on the left hand side. So um, TTH, BH gluon fusion, and BBF, and then the combination. Um, and you see here the results in terms of the um, observed over expected cross section times branching fractions. So in terms of the signal strength. And you see if you look at the uh, inclusive signal strength, um, Atlas measures 0 0.93 plus 0 0.13 uh, minus 0.12. So you see we get something like 0 0.12, 0 0.13 precision on the inclusive signal strength, which will um, fairly directly translate or 
to, to these um, coupling modifiers. So this is really a tremendous achievement compared to the um, more 30% like uncertainties that we had at the end of run one. And then you also see that um, clearly Hixa Tau Tau also helps um, to get precise measurements of uh, vector boson fusion and, uh, and gluon fusion production. On the right hand side, this is now shown um, in some of these STXS bins. Um, and you see that overall um, the, the, the observations agree well with the standard model predictions. And I want to just highlight here uh, the, the fact that the Higgs tau tau mode um, on this production side is actually very sensitive to high PT gluon fusion production and um, to vector boson fusion production, uh, where it's, uh, I think, even the most sensitive channel. So also here, to, to measure the production side, Hixotatao is super important. So we're not really getting back to that, but just, just, just to keep in mind that Hixotatao is not only about measuring the fermion couplings, although I, I'm focusing on that, um, but it's also to measure VBF production and gluon fusion production in, in great detail, and thereby be sensitive to the understanding model physics. So now, before I uh, introduce um, the run to CMS results, I want to briefly discuss the evolution of tower identification since run one. So I already mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk that in run one, we just used the cut-based isolation classifier. And here, this plot shows the misidentification probability against the electronic tower identification efficiency. This old isolation classifier is shown as this uh, as these blue dots here. And then already for the early run two analyses, we uh, moved on to using, instead of using this isolation sum classifier boost decision trees. And you see if you go from these uh, blue points to the black points that you actually get like a, an absolute 20 or relative more like 30 or even 35% gain in efficiency. So this already provided us with a huge jump um, in efficiency and background uh, rejection. Now, moving on to the very latest, uh, tower identification algorithms for the full run two results, we moved on to using a convolutional multi-class deep neural network um, that uses single particle information that is obtained in a grid around the tower axis, which is visualized here. So we have a very narrow grid directly around the tower axis and a broader grid um, a bit further away from the tower axis. And doing so um, compared to the already quite advanced boosted decision tree method, um, gives us another 20%, roughly 20% relative gain in efficiency. So you can see it here on the right-hand side where this old MBA classifier is shown in, in green. So this is the previous one we used and this new so-called deep tower uh, that classifier is shown as the red line. If you go for a fixed background identification efficiency to the right, you can see this relative 20% uh, or so gain in efficiency. And then I should also mention, because now we also do multi-class discrimination against electrons, because electrons are also an important background to hydronic tower identification, we get like a 10% additional gain from this anti-electron discriminator. So overall, combining this intermediate gain from the boosted decision tree classifier plus this, you see how much progress we also made on the object side compared to the run one uh, result. Now moving on to the Pixel Tower Tower results. So I already mentioned Atlas moved to the um, CMS run one strategy. Now CMS moved in the opposite direction for the very latest results. Um, and now we uh, train a deep neural network to be as sensitive as possible uh, to both the overall couplings and also the specific um, bins in this STXS scheme. And um, so here this plot shows how um, this is done, for example, for the more inclusive um, analysis. So we just look at the different production modes. Um, so we so this DNN um, has different output nodes. So this here is the uh, a GGH, so gluon fusion discriminator on the y-axis, um, and in the x-axis it's a VBF production discriminator. And then we can, um, depending on these values, we can put the events into different bins. And these bins are then shown here on the left-hand side in the in the plot and compared with the with the prediction. And what you see, if, if you look, for example, at the uh, most signal sensitive bins here in, in VBF production, you can see uh, that we now very clearly see um, the signal and are able to make uh, precise measurements. And you can also see the different contributions from um, VBF production, which is shown in orange, and from blue and fusion production, which is here more sensitive in these bin numbers uh, around 16 to 19 or so. Um, what well, makes up the majority of the case. So both, both of these are kind of equally important overall for the 
uh, for the analysis. But then everything agrees very well, even though you may be able to see that we again see a bit less uh, data compared to the expectation in, in CMS. So now let's look at the overall results for this analysis. So let's first look at the inclusive results. There is a small uh, procedure. So in this uh, plot on the left, these multiplicative factors are for everything, signal and background. You mean so, so in this plot here on the left side? Yeah. It, it is just, are just applied overall to, to everything, just okay. to make this a bit more visible, because otherwise that would be smaller. Because you see the scale is numbers of events times 10 to the 3. Yeah, yeah. So clearly we have super many background events sitting here at the least signal sensitive categories. So here just all of the contributions are scaled um, by, by these scaling yeah. factors yeah. to make them more visible. But there's yeah, but, but there's no uh, uh, no magic that it just rescales kind of the, the y-axis for these uh, parts of the spec. Okay. And then looking at the at the inclusive uh, results, you see here. Um, so this also now compares to the previous or additional full run true result that uh, it's rather the additional full run true results that we produced that is based on the standard technique of looking at the data and variant mass distribution with this cut based strategy. But this already this had like a, a uncertainties of 0.12, and with this one now we achieve uh, uncertainties of 0.11 or 0.10. So this is really a super nice precision on the inclusive signal strength. And then one other thing that this deep neural network approach helps with is to get more precise values in particular for uh, BBF production. And then here on the right hand side, now looking at the, again, these coupling modifiers to fermions on the y-axis uh, and vector bosons on the x-axis, you see the constraints from this cut-based analysis in red and from this neural network analysis in, in blue. And here you're able to see how this neural network able this is, is uh, able to constrain these couplings uh, uh, more tightly. And again, because of the kind of somewhat smaller observed signal strength compared to the expectation, um, actually our, our fermion constraints um, are in a very small tension with the standard model expectation of around 1.5 sigma or so. Um, right, and then also we can, we can also go into this STXS direction. Uh, where then with the deep neural network, you can just train dedicated classifiers per target category. And then you also get much improved constraints with this uh, neural network technique or with this uh, cut based technique as shown here. And then, so um, I want to be a bit brief to be also be, be able to cover Higgs to Mimiodi case in the following, but just now looking at the fermion couplings, because I said this is one of the, one of the motivations besides also uh, targeting the uh, production dynamics. So actually, very interestingly, Atlas already provided a preliminary full run two combination, uh, where they also look at the fermion couplings and the vector boson couplings. And it's kind of really the only plot that they show that has a small tension uh, with the standard model prediction with a p-value of 2.8%. So they um, see a bit smaller fermion couplings than predicted by the standard model uh, at their most likely value. And actually, interestingly, this is also the same thing that we see for this updated full run two Higgs or town analysis, where you also see a bit smaller uh, fermion coupling um, compared to the standard model expectation. So this is just a flag that clearly one of our motivations is to look for these deviations. And here we see a very small one, very insignificant one at the moment, but clearly the full run two single experiment and also the Atlas CMS combinations uh, will be uh, will be very interesting to probe this in, in a bit more detail and also the run three data. So um, I think we should all be watching out for the updated uh, results of these couplings. Okay, so now moving on to the next lab turn. Um, so I want to spend uh, the, the kind of uh, final or, or next 10 minutes or so on the Higgs boson decay to myons and uh, towards the first evidence. So Higgs and myons have very specific challenges and advantages. So, uh, and the challenges are clearly enormous. One is the, the low branching fraction that I already mentioned in the beginning uh, of 0.02%, which is still an order of magnitude smaller than Higgs to gamma gamma, which kind of has a similar um, resolution of the, of the, of the mass. Um, and in terms of backgrounds, um, it's also much more challenging compared to Higgs to gamma gamma. It's more comparable to Higgs to tau tau. Uh, because lots of stand oil processes give rise to muons and in particular dry production, so very similarly um, to Higgs to tau tau. 
And if you look, for example, at this 110 to 150 GB dimuon mass range, the rayon cross section is roughly 15 picobans um, to compare to 0.01 picobans for Higgs tibium here. So this is already the this off-shell part that drill in. So you see this enormous uh, uh, difference. On the other hand, clearly, um, Higgs tibium mu also has um, advantages, in particular compared to Higgs tau tau. And one of them is the excellent uh, mass resolution. Um, which you see here. So there are different um, categories that we use in our search for Higgs to mu mu. And in the most, um, in the best categories, we have a, a resolution of probably 1.4 or 7 GeV. Um, so this is uh, this is really a big advantage comparable to Higgs to gamma gamma. And then also overall, uh, again, compared to Tau's muons can be efficiently triggered, reconstructed, and identified. So this part is kind of uh, easy, but I should also mention that already to be getting to this resolution here, we have to play um, uh, quite a few tricks. So the strategy of this analysis depends on the channels. So in the gluon fusion, um, top associated and vector boson associated production channels, uh, we fit the reconstructed daimyo invariant mass distribution, various event categories. Uh, and then we use the BDT that doesn't use mass information to create different categories uh, with increasing signaturity. Whereas for the vector boson fusion channel, and I uh, go into a bit more detail in the next slides, but we just train and fit deep neural networks that distinguish a uh, signal uh, from the background. So first, uh, looking at gluon fusion um, production and uh, top associated vector boson associated production um, and at this categorization BDT. So this BDT uses kinematic input variables that are uncorrelated uh, with the H candidate class. So you can see here the separation between signal and blue, and uh, and background in red, and it's clearly because there's no mass information, and that it's it's not so easy to distinguish a signal from the background. And then um, one other trick that we use is that we weight the events in the training by one over the uh, mass resolution of the given event, which also which which makes sure ensures that the events with the best mass resolutions are also at high BDT values. Then if you look at the resolution in the different categories, with the most signal sensitive category being this. Uh, category five, you see that the mass resolution is actually uh, uh, 1.5 GeV. And then overall, then if, if we look at the mass resolution um, by S over S plus B, we see that we are then dominated by a uh, higher resolution events um, of 1.6 GeV. So this, uh, this, so this is kind of a very important and, and nice trick that improves the analysis. And then, um, Looking at the final signal extraction, um, picking just the highest um, BDT category, that's category five here. So events uh, beyond this dashed line here, we then perform a fit to this um, reconstructed daimyon mass distribution with functional forms. Um, and then the technique that we use is the so-called core PDF. So we have one uh, core function that we share across all the different categories and then have per category shape modifiers. Um, so polynomials, and this leads to a 10% improvement compared to the previous strategy of just using the different functional forms uh, for all the or independent functional forms for the different categories. And then for the vector boson fusion signal extraction, I already mentioned um, uh, that we use a different technique. And the reason is that if we used the GGH approach, which we did previously, then actually we have very few events in the most signal sensitive regions. And then we have only a few background events, so it's more difficult to constrain um, these functional forms that you see, whereas in the gluon fusion channel with many events, it's well possible. So this leads to large uncertainty. So instead, uh, we train deep neural networks that use various kinematic variables, including the daimyon invariant mass distribution as input, and that leads to a 20% improvement. So you can see the output here of this uh, deep neural network in a mass sideband here on the left-hand side. And, um, in the signal sensitive um, part here on the right hand side, where you see the VBF signal as this uh, as this uh, blue line here in the ratio plot. And you see that we see something that's roughly consistent um, with Higgs signal with 1.8 sigma significance expected and 2.4 observed. Now, if we put everything together, we arrive at an expected significance um, at our CMS best a measured mass value of 125.38 GeV of 2.5 um, standard deviations. And then um, in, the, in the observation, we see that exactly at this um, 
25.28 GeV. We have an um, significant in excess of three standard deviations. We are able to claim the first evidence for the Higgs to mean unit K. You can also clearly see that um, the VBF category is like construction. Uh, it's the most signal sensitive one, but also the GGH category is, the, is very important. So now uh, we can also visualize this excess by looking at S over S plus B weighted diamond invariant mass distribution. This is shown here, where again in the ratio plot, you see um, the nice um, diamond mass peak and the evidence for a signal. And then we can also use this um, by combining with other Higgs decay channels to get information on the production. We can also um, use this analysis to put constraints on this couple mu um, coupling, coupling modifier coupling strength. And here we observe 1.07 plus minus 0.2 at 68% um, confidence level. So now this is a very nice event display in the VBF category. We see the two muons and um, forward um, uh, jet activity going in these, uh, in these two directions. So this is one of the most signal sensitive uh, events. Then I just want to very briefly uh, mention also that Atlas also did a similar search very clearly um, fixed to be new decays. Um, one thing to point out is that for Atlas, um, it's kind of one of the really very few differences between Atlas and CMS that has a notable impact, and that is that they have this low magnetic field, so they have worse um, dimuon mass resolution at the Higgs mass game. But I should mention, um, and it's a bit important from the CMS analysis point of view, this is not, it, it's one of the aspects, but it's not the only aspect that gives CMS a slightly better um, sensitivity. But then if you look here at the mass resolution, it's um, it's like 2.6 GB or so compared to the, um, on average 1.6 we have in CMS. You see how that makes observing Higgs a bit more difficult in Atlas. Um, but they also have a nice result, expected significance of 1.7 standard deviations observed of 2.0, and the, <clears throat> they observe a new value of 1.2 uh, plus minus 0.6. Okay, and then very briefly, so not to forget about electrons, um, it, but it's this will really be a very long path ahead. Um, but we also looked for this. Um, I, I just showed the CMS result that we released earlier this year. So here the strategy is actually very similar to the one deployed in the Higgs to mu search and the gluon fusion category. Um, again, here we have a BDT that um, does not make use of the mass information, but um, puts events into different categories depending on how the Higgs-like um, they look. And then here on the right hand side, you see the reconstructed di-electron mass distribution for the most signal-like uh, BDT category. And then this has also, so this has um, these four gluon fusion categories shown here and also has two vector boson fusion categories um, that are not showing. So in this case, um, we find uh, both an above expected element that are equal on this branching vector of three times 10 to the minus four, clearly uh, orders of magnitude away from um, the standard model branching fraction, but they're actually in terms of uh, branching fractions limit quite close to the Higgs and mu sensitivity and uh, are the most stringent limits to date. Now putting things together. Um, right, one nice way of visualizing um, what we learned about the uh, couplings to leptons is to make this plot of the um, coupling modifiers or scaled coupling modifiers as a function of particle mass, uh, where we now put in this nice uh, new value for the muon coupling. Um, and then we also have uh, cup, uh, the, these, these values for the other particles, including the fermions. And uh, one thing I should mention is that this tau um, result here is not the latest. So you should watch out for updated, for a plot that has updated um, tau results also. And then also clearly Atlas produces a very similar um, plot in their preliminary full run to combination. So you see everything seems to line up very well, um, except that maybe if you look at these, these two fermion points, they're a bit below the expectation, which explains this, uh, this plot that I mentioned earlier in terms of the fermion coupling. So this is, this is uh, uh, the one interesting part um, to look out for. So let me summarize. Um, before I summarize myself, <laughs> um, I want to quote um, Gavin Salam, uh, because when, in 2019, I think he said something very important about um, Higgs decays to fermions. So, so I just want to quote that. So what he said is that 
um, the greater five sigma observations of the TTH process and of Higgs to tau tau and Higgs DVD decays independently by Atlas and CMS, firmly establish the existence of a new kind of fundamental interaction, Yukawa interactions. Um, then he explains why these are uh, very important because they are really qualitatively unlike any quantum interaction uh, probe before and also hypothesized responsible for the stability of hydrogen. And then very importantly here, establishing the pattern of your carbon couplings across the full remaining set of quarks and charged leptons, including the muons. My addition is one of the major challenges for particle physics today. Then he says, is this any less important than the discovery of the Higgs boson itself? And his opinion, no, because fundamental interactions are as important as uh, fundamental fundamental particles. So I thought it's uh, given this 10-year uh, uh, celebration, uh, I thought there's a good moment to um, bring this quote. So let me just finish with saying that the next 10 years promise to be very exciting. So we will clearly be probing Higgs to Tau Tau um, the case in a lot more detail, amongst other things, to be able to measure the fermion coupling as precisely as uh, possible, but also the production side. Then now we have evidence uh, for extreme immunity decays. We clearly want to observe this and then also want to measure the coupling precisely. And maybe there's also a surprise in store of the Higgs to Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Really exciting talk, and particularly your closing statement, uh, citing Gavin Salah. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, so so now the floor is open for questions. Uh, I would like to first ask people connected over Zoom. Uh, let's see if, if there are any. Oh yes, there are. Uh, so let's first take the outside people. So uh, Ram, uh, please unmute and uh, yeah. Hi, Jan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, uh, so my question is uh, regarding the run two Higgs dot analysis on the CMS side. So you said like uh, CMS is using uh, BDT for the GGH category and uh, the neural network for the VBF category. So what is the like, motivation behind this choice? Uh, why not for neural network for both of them? So sorry. Yeah. sorry the run two, yeah, the run two Higgs dot analysis for CMS. Like the choice say, of uh, no for Higgs to Tau Tau actually, I hope I didn't miswrite, but for, for the Higgs to Tau Tau for run two, it's deep neural networks everywhere. So it's it's deep neural networks here and um also for the like expense. So yes, this this depends on the details. So we have this this dedicated SDXS classifiers. Um, and then also these these multi class classifiers, yes. But the, maybe maybe the, because for the muons actually, that actually true that we have a BDT in the muon fusion um, and TTH and VH categories to create these categories. But then a deep neural network um, yeah, yeah, in the BDF yeah, categories for, for maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was for the muon. Sorry. So why this choice? Like why not DNNs for both? Instead of, I think, uh, well, um, from my perspective, so I think clearly it, it always depends on, on what the people do. And since these are used for very different purposes, it's of course fine to use BDTs and, and uh, deep neural networks. But as long as, as you use like high level input variables, um, the performance of deep neural networks and boosted decision trees is uh, typically very similar. So in that sense, there's, there's no gain from using deep neural networks over. Um, the decision tree. So the gain, as as I tried to explain a bit, but I didn't have time to gloss it. Um, so like where deep neural networks really start to help is if you have like more fine grained. So in, in our case, more detector level um, information, like we do have here for the tau identification. So the reason, so so if you just use these high level input variables and use instead a DNN also for the identification, you will see no difference in the performance. So we actually tried this and it gives basically the same performance. But when you use these the low level information, this is something that at some point the BDTs become too complex, they can't deal with. Whereas this um, is very natural for a deep neural network that has some structure like a convolutional structure or a graph-based structure. And, and there we get these, uh, these large gains. So in that sense, on the analysis side, it doesn't actually doesn't matter so much, and it's more a matter of uh, of appearance whether you use uh, BDTs or DNNs. Okay, 
So thank you, Ram. Uh, yeah, so next one, uh, Arun. Uh, hi, Ian. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Nah, nice talk. So uh, uh, I actually wanted to understand this. Uh, you have some kind of fluctuations in the H2 tau tau, no? So it, it's more than uh, one sigma flux, downward fluctuation. I was just wondering in your slide 28, yeah, exactly in the slide 28, previous one. Yes. Yeah, so in hindsight, it looks like you get this fluctuation from the la uh, last bin, right? Where you see the data is uh, less than the expected one. So I was thinking what kind of studies uh, I mean, have been performed to see that, you know, it's not like just a binning effect, it's something real. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not just coming from this uh, from this kind of uh, um, very last bin, and also as far as I understand, but I have to double check. So one thing I should point uh, out is here, here we have no summary statistics. So this is just the muon plus hadronic tower channel. So this is not this is not all the data that goes into the plot. So maybe it's it's more visible from the other plots, and uh, and, and we should be looking at at all of them. And I should actually also mention. <laughs> Which, which I should have done during the talk. But actually, um, one interesting thing is that for the full run tour results, kind of the one with two hadronic taus are now the most signal sensitive ones, thanks to the improvements in the in the tau reconstruction identification. But yeah, I, I think to, to answer this question properly, we have to look at, at the plots for, for, for all the channels, but it's certainly not just coming from this uh, from this one bin. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you a question on this slide? Huh? Yeah, so so yeah, so so Kajari has a question on this particular this slide. slide. So, the right hand plot. Uh, can you please explain a bit? You are plotting the rapidity. Yes, yeah, so this so this is then so these y's are a kind of ratio score. So this is kind of uh, defined to be one if kind of the, the output is one divided by um, the, the QPH score plus background and GGH score. So you have these different scores. So kind of zero is when, when the background scores, some of the background scores is kind of one. Then if you have the GGH score, which is here in the, in the numerator is so kind of, if this is, if this is one, then we sit here and then we have all these, uh, and then here in the middle, actually, for example, this bin 15, this is also very signal sensitive. It just has a mixture of uh, QQH and, and GGH. Mm -hmm. So this is where you have uh, that both the GGH and QQH output have high but comparable values and the uh, background output nodes give very, very small values, right? And so this is, yeah. And then this plot, so so anyway, we have these, so what this plot describes is how we then define the bins that go into this plot that we use for the signal extraction. And then as mentioned, this is just for the for, yeah. for one of the four final states. <laughs> Higher bin side means bin number means uh, better signal sensitivity. Okay. Not necessarily, actually, because <laughs> also, I mean, it, it, it's just it's it's also grouping a bit by right. So so kind of yeah. in maybe yeah. So maybe up to up to bin twenty or so, kind of the bins are ordered to give uh, in the last bins more sensitivity to gluon fusion. So kind of the last bin, so this last bin here, this last bin here, here, and maybe still here, these are very, and, and even here, like this bin 20, you see that this, so this blue contribution is um, gluon fusion. So these are very sensitive to gluon fusion. Mm. So it, even these, these bins 18 and 20 here. So for, for this first part of the spectrum, kind of last bin means very sensitive to gluon fusion and also overall sensitive to the signal. And then the VBF specific bins are these last, uh, or these last ones where in all of them, because uh, the value is already high, you have quite a lot of VBF sensitivity. And this is why then here the orange starts to uh, dominate. Yeah, so I would say that uh, those are the bins uh, which are basically establishing the signal. No. Right, no, I, I, yeah, you're right. Kind of the, I mean, clearly these, these here are, beyond 21 uh, establishing the vector boson fusion signal but then we do actually also if you look at the results establish a very clear gluon fusion signal um kind of with five sigma sensitivity and this comes from these bins where the 
uncertainties in the data are a bit smaller and, and even kind of from, from these spins where you have well, even these spins here like like bin 11 has like one sigma sensitivity and if you combine all the channels these will these will also help so it's it's a bit more difficult to clearly these are not as clean for gluon fusion but we do also have good sensitivity to, to gluon fusion and this is also important okay Thank you. okay uh so arna hi can you hear me yes uh, yes uh, I have one question uh, regarding the slide where you have shown the results of Higgs to dimuon channel. So I just wanted to. Uh, make a correction that uh, on the first slide, I mean, of this Higgs to dimuon, where you. I don't know which. I don't know which, which slide exactly. Uh, maybe two, three slides back, where you, the first For one. the challenges? Before this, yes, this one. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, uh, this, uh, when you say this 15 picobarn drillion cross-section between 110 to 150, probably it should be slightly higher, around 47 or something. Uh, and uh, that's one thing that I want to mention. And the other thing that you, I've mentioned about the uh, the resolution of the dimuon. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. My impression is uh, slightly uh, uh, different than how you concluded about them and comparing between the diphoton and the dimuon. I think, I mean, if you uh, if you look carefully between the the categories and uh, and also the the, mm, the the combined categories, uh, it seems like in most of the cases. Uh, the resolution of the dimuon uh, Higgs to dimuon is slightly better compared to uh, diphoton. That's what I found actually. I mean, uh, while doing the analysis, so uh, it's I mean not very much, but yeah, I mean uh, like if I remember correctly, the dimuon uh, resolution was like about 1.5 GV compared to the diphoton, which is at two and 2.1 GV, something like that. So yeah, these are the two things that I just wanted to mention, clarify uh, about this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually for the, so, so this 15 Pico Barn had took from Stefan Cooperstein who gave it to me. So, well, but I should double check. So I didn't calculate this myself. So maybe you're right and it's a different value. Um, okay. And yeah, I, I think uh, point taken for, for the Higgs to gamma gamma. I was check. I was comparing with, I, I found somewhere 1.4 GV number. So I, I thought that maybe for the, the there are categories next to gamma gamma yes, that yes. have even better there resolution. resolution but better I think yes. exactly. But I think your so my point was more that there exist categories that have even better resolution. But you're probably right, and on average, and this is probably the point you're wanting uh, trying to make that that Higgs and has better resolution. But I think yeah. it doesn't matter so much to me. It's more that this is kind of high resolution and and very comparable. Let's say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so please go. On. Yeah, for the kappa V kappa F uh, plot, for at last you gave the P value for the standard model. What about for CMS? Yeah, this is a question. So this, uh, I, I need to see if we have that. So we didn't put it on the plot, as you see, but well, it, it's probably, it's, it's, it's above 5%, right? So it's probably something like, uh, I don't know. So, so it's consistent within two standard deviations. So it must be something like 8%. So is this so. what is driving the p value for this, uh, uh, what should I say, John Ellis plot? The mass versus coupling? Yeah, the mass versus coupling, and this has better. But yeah, this but is kind is of. It, like, is it the one which is driving the p value to be so bad? Yeah, I mean, here the p value uh, yeah. is uh, this one here, Atlas. So, so if you remember from the previous slide, this, so they have 2.8% p value for the uh, fermion versus vector boson, whereas for this plot, it's 19%. Yeah. But here you kind of probe, right? So, but this plot doesn't know that if you scale kind of all these three together, this is kind of the logic behind this. If, if you assume they are independent, then it's more consistent. But if you assume that, uh, there's one combined fermion coupling as is, for example, could be um, kind of some, for example, twitch, uh, 2H doublet models uh, predict. Then 
uh, this p value becomes becomes smaller, right? So maybe. Yeah, I'm wondering that uh, this uh, kappa f, which is uh, driving the overall p value. Yeah, the kappa f exactly. It, it's for this another hypothesis that we you have just one coupling modifier. So it's it's a bit. It's not exactly like perfectly exactly like this, but it's a bit like combining mm -hmm. these four fermion entries here to combine measurement and then comparing that to the two dashed line. I mean, it's not exactly like that, but I think that's a fair approximation. And then you see if you do that, because all of them except for the neon with the uh, worst precision, all of them are kind of more than one signal below one. Then in the combination, there will be more than two signal away from one. Yeah, but mu one and uh, b or the top they have larger errors. So main thing will come from the wz and the weightage will be more for uh, those no? wz and top. Is right. I mean, actually, the the top precision it's not so bad compared to tau. So it's 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 terrible okay. somehow. Uh, because but but this is because this this top it comes from for example tth production but it's also present in the gluon fusion loop so measuring gluon fusion precisely will also give us uh, a handle on that one so this is kind of uh comparable in precision it's just that yeah uh, if, if you look on the other hand on this <laughs> uh, only on the decay side then Kili Higgs to tau tau is by far the most sensitive decay channel but yeah. this is because different final states probe gluon fusion but yeah, it's on this plot again. Uh, they are talking about MS bar scheme for the mass and uh, para class. This uh, comment in the middle. Yes. And similarly for CMS also, it is the same uh, MS bar scheme. Yeah, I need to. I need to recall. I, I think we're using the same scheme, and they just put it explicitly. Uh, but I would need to confirm. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, actually, I had one small question, and that would be probably the final question before we close. Um, so, on slide 31, when you saw this um, result from the cot based and um, uh, neural network based, uh, <coughs> right? And the cot based, of course, I mean, the neural network based uh, result is more sensitive than the cot based, but the fact is, the uh, cot based is. Uh, Kind of more standard model like so I, I, I suppose I mean I, I didn't read the paper but uh, I suppose there's been cross check or, or validation has been done there is no particular bias or anything coming because of the neural network thing like something like using the standard candle j2 tau tau or something like it, this has been both the analysis has been uh validated like there's no no particular bias or something i'm i'm sure this has been done right so would you like to comment on that yeah no i mean clearly the we, we do all the standard bias tests and so on so we think that the neural network analysis is is indeed solid and just has better precision i should say that the the correlation always between mm -hmm. these two results even even if you retrain the deep neural network we found in some other analysis the correlation between two analyses can only be 80 percent or so so actually the the correlation between these two analyses is not that high so it's not surprising to see a difference like that it's uh yeah so so at the, at the one sigma level so this is uh, this is something that that you would expect to uh, um, see if you follow these quite different uh, approaches okay good so yeah yeah, yeah. so so thank you very much uh, again, Jan, for your yeah, uh, wonderful so talk much. and all the- Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. And um, yeah, and um, for all the people um, here,